Good morning. Glad to have you with us again today. We are in the book of Revelation, looking forward to our time as we go through. And this is going to be an amazing study, just reminding us of the preeminence of Christ. And it's kind of neat as we just look in our culture and all of us are so interested in what God's going to do and how is he going to do it? When is he going to do it? Why is he going to do it? What does it say about him? What does it say about his character? What does it mean for us today? Um, believers are just fascinated with uh, what it's going to be like when we're with the Lord someday. Revelation is going to answer a lot of questions and leave a lot of questions unanswered for us. But we'll find as we go through this that it's all about Christ. It's about Christ transforming history, transforming our future, showing us the, the reality of the promise that we have in Christ. He transforms all things, and that's what it's about. We're in chapters 1 through 3 right now, and we're looking at this. John, write about the things that you have seen. Well, what has he seen? Jesus Christ is transformed. Uh, he is different. He has changed. He has ascended to heaven. Now he's exalted. He's ministering to his church. So he loves us. He loves his church. He loves you this morning. He wrote specifically here to seven churches, and then the letters were to be seen by other churches, and then ultimately by us. And he's writing because he loves his church. He wants to encourage us and equip us and help us to have a, a, a worldview and a mindset so that we can engage this world with confidence in Jesus Christ. The purpose of Revelation is, is threefold, really. It's to encourage holy living, to encourage faithful living. And God will just call us to that. Uh, it's to reveal the fulfillment of God's program. God has a program. He's got a future. He's carrying out. He lays that out here in Revelation so that we can see what's coming, have confidence in that. And ultimately... The fulfillment of that is through and in the person of Jesus Christ. We see God the Father there. We see the Holy Spirit there. But we see Jesus Christ front and center throughout the book of Revelation. He is the one who will rule and reign in his name and yet under the, under the, the, the will of his Father. And the call of Revelation is that we would simply be ready. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. We talk, we've talked about that already here in Revelation. And uh, God's timetable is certainly different than ours. But it's only been, according to his timetable, two days, according to Peter. Uh, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. And John says, come, Lord Jesus. That's to be our mindset. As we listen this morning, as we open the word, as we read, our mind is to be this, Lord, come and come today. So the first three verses as we came here is simply about relationship. It's about relationship of Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about identity. It's about blessing. Uh, it's about the cost of identity. And uh, verse 4 is a reminder to us that, that words matter. 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. It's about grace to you and peace. And so in Christ, he gives us all these things. In Christ, he calls us to identify with him, walk with him. In Christ, he promises us the blessing of his grace and his peace ultimately here. And so he's writing to the churches. And this morning as we pick up in verses 9 through 11... He's going to remind us, what are the fundamentals uh, of unity? What are the fundamentals that unite us together? Let's pick that up as we read. John writes in verse 9, I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write, what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, and to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. As John writes, he's identifying with these churches. He's connecting with them. He's knit together in his heart. And he shows us the elements from his heart as he's connecting with these seven churches and ultimately with us. What are, what are essentials that bring unity? What are the fundamentals, the basic fundamentals of unity? What are the things that unite us together as a church here in Emmanuel, in your church that you attend, in the church of Christ around the world? What are some of the basics? What is he, what is he calling these seven churches to see in these short verses right here? Well, the first thing, the first fundamental that he reveals to us is simply this is that we, are, we have a spiritual bond. We are united in that bond that we have. We see that here in, in verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and your partner. John is expressing, he's showing here, 
And, and we love to see this in people that we respect and adore and, and our leaders that, that are over us, simply the humility of heart. John is expressing such humility here. He is, he is an apostle, one of the twelve, that walked with Jesus, that was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, the only apostle we believe that's now living at this time. The others have, have passed away. And John, John could have had, you know, an attitude, I'm, I'm better than you, I'm greater than you. Uh, he, could have, he could have conveyed, I'm not approachable, don't, don't come close to me. And yet he was, he was the one whom Jesus loved. He was the one who conveyed love in his writings so dearly and so closely and so clearly. And he says, you know what, I'm your brother. He's an apostle, but he's more than that. He's a brother with these churches. He's a brother with each one who calls on the name of Christ. He says, we are, we are knit together. We are, we are in this journey together. We're in this walk of faith together. He says, it's not my walk and your walk. We are walking together. I need you and you need me. I need all the encouragement that you need as well from Christ. And he's not writing as an apostle, looking back. He's writing as a prophet. He's looking ahead. He's showing us what God's going to do with Jesus through Jesus Christ. It's important. And he says, I'm a partner. I'm a co-laborer. I'm a co-sharer with you and all of these things. What I'm writing about to you, I'm sharing in these things as well. Let's, let's bring our hearts together. Let's understand that we are together on this journey. Paul just picks up and reveals this. He just, he just echoes this in Romans 8, 17. He says, we are, we are children of God. Not only that, we are heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. We stand together. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior this morning, then, then we're, just, we're together. We're family. That's what we are. We're family in Christ. We, we have been called to walk with Him. We're children. We're always growing, always in need of growing. And yet we're heirs together. He has given us His very, very best. And yet until we're there, we need the Lord. And so, and so we're bound together in that. We're, we're bound in the love of Christ, by the love of Christ, through the love of Christ. We're bound by Christ together. He's what draws us together. If we are anything that is good in Emmanuel, it's because Christ is, is drawing us together as family. If he is, he is instilling on us that we belong together and with each other, because of what Christ has done, he will, he will bring unity within the body of Christ. Matthew chapter 12 is, is a reminder to us. Jesus Christ is being visited by his, uh, he's speaking, and his mom and his brothers come to visit him, and they, and they make a request. We want to talk. We want to talk. with. Can we talk with Jesus? And to those to whom he's speaking, this is his reply. He says to them here in, in chapter 12. He replies, he stretches out his hands toward his disciples there in the middle of the verse. And he says, but here's my brothers, here's my sisters, my mother. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and my mother. He says, here's the key. The family of God is made up by those who do the will of God. And so we're, we're drawn together, we're, we're bonded together in Christ, and we're called to this. As Jesus followed the will of his Father here on earth, and now still abides and, and, and conveys to us the will of the Father, we who are genuine children in the family of God, we are also committed to the will of God. We are family. You know, we're just family. We go through challenges together, hardships together. We share them together. We are united together. John just says, I'm your brother. John says, I'm, I'm a partner with you. I have the same needs that you have. I have the same yearning as in my heart for you because we're family. That is a fundamental of unity, that we understand who we are in Christ, that we understand that God's drawn us together. Every church, every local church, is drawn together by Christ, perfectly fit for that local body. And that local body is to understand, we are to understand that we are a family. We're not only family in that local body, we're family with other believers, but, but in a special way with that, with that local body, we're to be knit together. Another essential is, is the, the understanding. We have not only... Uh, the sense of family, but we share an understanding together. We share a, a biblical perspective. We share a worldview. It's very important we understand this. He says also in verse nine, "I am your, I am your brother. I'm your partner in the tribulation. I'm your, I'm your brother. I'm your partner in tribulation." We share, we share this reality that adverse, adversity is is real. This is real. The fundamentals, the fundamentals of, of being unified in Christ. It's in the context of the adversity that we face because we follow Christ. It's in the context of the trials and the tribulations of these believers right here 
in, in these churches in Asia Minor that are, that are undergoing great persecution and great suffering and great adversity, you know, just like you and I face, and they're, and they're facing that because of Christ. Believers around the world face adversity in their life because of their identity with Jesus Christ. We all have real hardships. We all have adversity. The adversity that he speaks to and is calling us to recognize it is that adversity that comes because we are in Christ and, and the world hates, hates us. And so it stems from our identity in Jesus Christ. He writes, John wrote in his gospel, chapter 16, I've said all these things, everything I've written, that in me you might have peace, Jesus says. In me you might have peace. In the world you are going to have tribulation. You will have tribulation. You'll have adversity, hardship because of me, because of Christ. But take heart, I have overcome the world. There's an understanding there that, that we are family, but there is an understanding there that we face real adversity. There is tribulation that we face. Uh, in the tribulation, John here in this verse, in this context, is not speaking about the great tribulation that's to come in Revelation. It's simply the tribulation that we face as believers. There is the great tribulation that the Revelation is all about. We're going to encounter that. We're going to see that. But I believe for clear reasons, that's not what he's referring to here. He would take us back and remind us of this verse right here. And he would just, he would just say to us, there is tribulation that we all face. There is tribulation that is, that is the reality of every believer. And that's what's being faced by these believers here specifically in, in this verse, in this chapter 1 here in Revelation as well. We also understand that there is hope and there is accountability that we, that we have. He says, I'm your brother, I'm your partner in tribulation and also in the kingdom. You know, that's, that's, that's absolutely beautiful. He's, he's giving to us there a positive picture of the certainty we have in Christ. There is a kingdom that is, will be ours, that's coming. And Jesus Christ is promising to us everything good that will be ours for all eternity. To live with Jesus Christ, to serve with Jesus Christ, to experience righteousness for all eternity, sinlessness. To, to experience the mind of Christ in fullness, to be with the Lord and all of those things. Um, and so the hope is this, is, is that we have that certainty in heaven. We have that certainty. But there's also an accountability because where there's a kingdom, there is a king. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and we are accountable to him. We are called to follow his rule. We are called to yield and submit and to obey to his to his uh, His rule in our life, his his uh, call in our life. And we are a part of that spiritual kingdom now. It's going to be realized someday. We're going to walk, we're going to walk in, in a very literal kingdom. We're going to live in a very literal kingdom, as real as your flesh and blood, as the things that are around you today, but without sin, in perfection, under the domain and love of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 25 reminds us, Jesus says, this is in the future. He's separating the sheep from the goats. And to us who are believers, he will say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From eternity past, this has been his plan. This has been his desire for his people. And uh, that is hope. And that is accountability. We must live today in light of the glories, the promises, the blessings of tomorrow. We also understand that there is a need for real strength. He says, I'm your brother, I'm your partner, not only in tribulation, not only in the kingdom, but also in patient endurance. Patient endurance. He calls us to endure because there is tribulation, there is adversity. You're going to be asked to take a stand for Jesus Christ. You're going to be asked to say no to things that are wrong because of Christ. You're going to ask to to stand up for things that are right and good and holy. You're going you're gonna to be asked to be an ambassador, a mouthpiece, a spokesman for Jesus Christ in a world who needs the gospel, in a world who needs to see the grace and love that is conveyed through the gospel of Jesus Christ in a sinful world. You and I, every believer, are asked to take that stand. It will create adversity in our life because the world will react against that. We are called to patiently endure the trials and testings that God places in our life, the, the, uh, the temptations that are thrown against us by the world, the adversity that's thrown against us. Paul, Paul understands this. In fact, he conveyed this, this very same thing. He says in Acts chapter 14, we're to, 
I've, I, my desire is to strengthen the disciples, to encourage them to continue in the faith. That's, that's perseverance. That's endurance. Because there are many tribulations, and through all of those tribulations, we must enter, it says, the kingdom of God. God, God requires that every believer go through the path of tribulation and testing just as he did for us. It is the call of Christ on our life that we walk as Jesus walked, that we understand what it means to be a, a, a servant, a slave, a follower of Jesus Christ, just as he followed after his Father completely and wholly. He calls us to the same thing so that we might have an opportunity to reveal the blessing, to reveal our love for the Lord, our allegiance to our Lord. How important. So, you know, we see these things. Um, these elements that Paul talks about, he summarizes. And it's so important that we just catch that and understand that. That's, uh, that's in our life as well. Philippians chapter 1. Paul writes these words, and they just are, they just convey the heart that we are to have for one another. As we walk through adversity, trials, tribulation, as we are called to patiently endure, as we keep our mind on eternity and what Christ is giving to us, Paul says, this is my mind for you. This is my prayer for you as a believer. And I believe we should yearn for people to pray for us the same way. I'm going to read portions of these verses, not the whole thing. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you because of your partnership in the gospel. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This just conveys the heart that every believer is to have for one another. We are to be yearning for this to be true in our life, yearning for others to pray this, that it would be true in our life, and that we would be praying this for one another. We are to be committed to this kind of love for one another. How about you and I? Is this our heart? As we think about the church, as we function in the church, do we function in the church so that we would strengthen the family of God? When you come to church, when you're involved in the church, do you function, do you contribute within the church in such a way that the body of Christ is strengthened? Do you contribute in such a way, do you come here to bring uh, the comfort of the Lord to others? Do you come to church for an opportunity, looking for an opportunity to bring God's comfort to others? Do you come to church, do you come and step within the body of Christ and look for God to use you this way? To receive hope, to give hope to others? Because there is a promise, there is a certainty, there is eternal life in Christ. To, to accept accountability. Do you step within the body of Christ and say, I want that accountability. I know that the Jesus is my king and I will give an answer to him today. I will give an account to him today. So may, may others in Christ help me to, to help, uh, help me to be conformed to the image of Christ now. I want that. I embrace it. I'm open to that. God says that's to be our heart as we engage the body of Christ with one another and to find and to give strength. Do you come to the body of Christ to receive strength, to give strength, to let God pour into your life what you need and to, and to, and to give that, to pour that out and to share it with others? God calls us to be active in His church and the body of Christ, to reflect the realities that we just see right here, to have an understanding about life and ministry, we are here to receive and to give these things in the name of Christ to one another. We're not, come just to, we're not to come to church just to listen to the preacher preach. We're not to come to church and sit in a pew and just receive. We're to come so that we can give and share and invest and, yes, receive the strength of Christ into our life. It is to be holistic. That's the challenge. Max Cato puts it this way, God never said that the journey would be easy, but he did say that the arrival would be worthwhile. I like that. When we're in heaven, it's going to be worth it all. A great reminder. Finally, in these verses, we are reminded this, this fundamentals, these basic fundamentals of unity. We have a spiritual bond. We have a shared understanding. And, and we are to have a strong commitment together. That is another basic fundamental of unity. That we are committed to the same things. That we're committed to genuine, 
authentic relationship. He writes, all these things, I am your brother in, in, in tribulation, in the kingdom, in, in enduring, that are in Jesus. All of these things are, are identified and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All these things are because of Jesus Christ. All these things are flow from Jesus Christ, his ability to help us in that adversity. It is about Jesus Christ always. It's about relationship. We're to be committed to the person of Jesus Christ. We're to be committed to him. We're to be committed to walking with him. As a family, we're to re be reinforcing that. Why well, I wish our conversations more, when we're together, would be more about encouraging this. We'd be actually intentional in our words and our phrases and our conversations with each other to be encouraging this. That we would simply be authentic in our relationship, in our walk. It'd be okay to share. It's okay to be real. It's okay uh, to, to receive so that Christ can be better, bigger, stronger in my life. Paul reminds us that God is, Jesus Christ has broken down all the barriers that stand between us. These are just a few here in this verse. But we're all one in Christ Jesus. These barriers right here, he's broken them down. There's a lot that could be said about this, but at the heart of this, it's just this. God is breaking down barriers. That's what he's doing. That's what he does. We come to church, so many, so many times we have, a, we have a wall up. We just don't let people get close. We don't want a relationship. We don't encourage relationship. We don't let people invest into our life. We don't let people even see us. Only the outside. We don't dare let people look into our life. We don't dare share so that we can, so that we can gain strength to, together. The Lord's desire is to break barriers down in our heart between us and Him and to break barriers down between us and others and unite us together so that we'd be strengthened. We're committed to Christ that He would do a work in our heart. That is a commitment we must have and we must be committed to the Word of God. He was on the island called Patmos. Why? On account of the Word of God. Because of, because, because of the impact of the Word of God. Because His identity with the Word of God standing on the truth of the Word of God. That's important. We're to be committed to that. Are you committed to the Word of God? Is the Word of God changing your life? Do you live your life because of obedience to the Word of God? Do you even know what the Word of God says about things that are in your life? Do you know God's heart towards you? Have you ever opened the Scriptures and looked for yourself? Have you ever just studied the Scriptures on a topic, on an area of life that's a challenge for you? Have you simply spent time yourself? Pursuing God's heart. Are you willing to take a stand upon the Word of God, upon a principle from the Word of God that is contrary to, to the world's view? God calls us to have a confidence and a boldness to do that. He calls us to embrace the Word of God and to bring it into our life. Paul puts it so succinctly and so beautifully, he just says this, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it dwell in you personally. We're to be committed to the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He was committed also to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is preeminent. We're committed to Christ, but is He preeminent in your life? Is He preeminent in my life? Does He have first place? Am I willing to lay all the pieces of my life before the Lord and say, Lord, every area of my life, every piece, Lord, it's yours first before it's mine. Before it belongs to me, it belongs to you. Lord, I give it to you that you might use it. You might shape it. You might help me to, to use whatever this is in a way that honors you. And if this piece, this part of my life doesn't honor you, Lord, I'm willing to let it go. Jesus Christ, that's what he was. He was preeminent. He was, he was committed to his Father. He had, the Father had first place in his heart. And Jesus Christ to have, is to have first place in our heart and is to show. Just in verse 5 here in this chapter, John reminds us that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He's faithful in every way. The Father was preeminent in his life, and he followed the Father in everything. He was the firstborn of the dead. He, he rose from the dead. He, he followed that course. Even though he was sovereign, he is sovereign over all. He set all those things aside. He's ruler of the kings of the earth, but he set that aside to love us and to show that by, by giving his life for us. And so because, because of that love, we're called to elevate Jesus Christ to the very throne of our heart and say, Lord... You're mine above everything else. We're to be committed to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John says, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit 
and the Lord did something special and significant. This is a phrase that is that is significant in this book. It marks off different different sections of the scripture of Revelation. We're going to see that. What John is receiving are visions. Where John is receiving his input from God. These are not what John is going to write convey is not his own thoughts. It's from God. We're going to see that he's being controlled by the Spirit of God. Uh, this is not inspired or induced by by uh, by him, by uh, anything or anyone else. What what we have here in 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 our hands in the Book of Revelation, it's from God Himself as He gives it to John. John lays it out. He writes it. This isn't the words of John, it's the words of the Spirit. It's important. We see four occasions here in Revelation where John is, is in the Spirit. And uh, see in, in, in this verse here, it's on the Lord's Day. In chapter 4, he's in the Spirit, he's in heaven, then he's going to be in the wilderness, and then he's going to wind up on the mountain of God. All these are, are in control of the Spirit of God. You know, if we go back to the Old Testament, we encounter Ezekiel. We see in Ezekiel four different times on this page. Uh, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. The Spirit lifted me up. The Spirit fell upon me. The Lord brought me down, brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord, set me down to a valley full of bones. We see that, the valley of bones. The Spirit of God, instrumental in what Ezekiel was seeing from God and, and what he was doing. In chapter 8 of Ezekiel, we see this. And he sees a man, a, a form of appearance of a man. He, he put out the form of a hand and he took me by the lock of my head and the Spirit lifted me up between heaven and earth and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem. You know, these things of John, these things of Ezekiel, other places that we could go, are these real? Are they physical? What's going on? Is John in a trance? Well, I believe, I, is, is this medically induced? No. This is the spirit of God, not man's spirit. Um, this, is, this is God at work, the spirit of God at work. We've already seen that earlier. We saw the Father. We saw the spirit of God. We see the Jesus Christ. We see the Trinity here. And in this verse, it is a spirit who now is doing something special in his, in his life. Paul puts it this way. He says, I went to heaven 14 years ago as he writes this. I was caught up to heaven, a third heaven. I don't know if it was in the body or if it was out of the body. I don't know. He says, I know this. God knows. You know, we can't have the final answer here. Sometimes as we look at these texts, what's going on, sometimes it seems clear that, that, that the individual is lifted up into heaven. Other times it seems like in the spirit they are lifted. It's hard to know. But what, what's true, and here's the key, here's the key, is the spirit of God is doing something transformative and essential. God is leading. So for us, the principle is simple. Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. That's not saying to us we're going to have these visions and be lifted to heaven, but it says to us the very same Spirit who was at work with Ezekiel and with David and with Daniel and with Ezekiel and so many others is the same Spirit of God who in the New Testament lives within us, touches our heart, uses us, guides us, directs us, calls us. We're to be led. In fact, he's, he says here very strongly, the Spirit of God, if he's instrumental in my life, and moving in my life, that is a mark of affirmation that I belong to the Lord. Without, If I look into my life and I simply don't see the fruit of the Spirit, I don't see the work of the Spirit of God, then I'm not a child of God. Those are the words of the Scriptures to our hearts this morning. Another commitment is this, it's a priority of worship. He's, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day. This is the only time, this is the only time in the Bible that the phrase the Lord's Day is actually used. We have the first day of the week, which was Sunday, clearly. We have the Lord's Supper. But this is the only time this phrase is used. It doesn't become popular as an expression among the church until the second century. So what is it referring to here? Some say tied to Thessalonians and try to make a tie here that it's talking about the day of the Lord. Well, in Revelation, we clearly see the day of the Lord. But in context here, there's, there's no context that tells us that this is the day of the Lord. It simply doesn't exist in this context. It's not there. And the connection between Thessalonians just breaks down. As to referencing back to here, it is the day of the Lord. So I believe here clearly simply this. It is, it is the Lord's day. Remember, John was under the rule and the reign, as he wrote this in 95 AD, he was, under the, he was under the rule and reign of Domitian, who was the emperor of Rome. Rome, he, he demanded, he commanded that everyone under his thumb, everyone under his rule, call him Lord and God. He demanded that kind of allegiance and that kind of worship. And in the first day of every month, 
he demanded that it be set aside that the people worship him. So it was the emperor's day. So this quite possibly is simply a response of John to that decree to say, no, it's not about the emperor's day. It is about the Lord's day. It is the first day of the week. It is Sunday. We give it to the Lord. Our allegiance is to him. It is not to you, Domitian. It is the Lord's day. At any rate, it's this. It's worship. He was in the spirit and he was worshiping. He was before the Lord and he was, he was worshiping before the Lord. Worship is so significant. Jesus in his own ministry and life, he worshiped. He made it a habit to be in the synagogue. Every week he was in the synagogue. He was worshiping. If anyone didn't need to be there, it was him. If anyone would desire to be there, it was him. He wanted to be, he wanted to be with a body, with, with others who love the Lord, worshiping his Lord in the context of the synagogue, the temple, in obedience to the scriptures, and to be lifting up his Father. Hebrews 10 calls us, the Lord calls us to worship. We're called to worship. We're called to meet together regularly, faithfully. There is, there is the day of the Lord that's coming. And we're called to worship. We're called to come together. We're called to have a perspective in our heart. Worship brings that perspective. It is a sin not to gather together with God's people. There are too many who are listening and too many who are in our churches that simply don't make it a faithful habit to be in church. Every Sunday they are given to other decisions, other choices, and pull away from church, the body of Christ. It's not about the location. It's about the command of the Lord. It's about the desire of the Lord for your life. To be faithful and coming together with God's people to set aside a day, a time, to worship the Lord together. That's what this is all about. He calls us to this. Worship is, worship is, is from the heart. Worship is to be amazed. It's to be amazed by God. When we worship, we are amazed. When we worship, we never lose that sense of amazement of who God is and what He's done. There's a quote here. I really like how it's laid out. It's so amazing how God can turn a mess into a message. A test into a testimony. A trial into a triumph. And a victim into, into a victory. God does all of these things. Only God can do that. I don't know who this person is, but I thought that quote was telling. Because that's what God does. When we, when we worship, we're simply recognizing God is doing amazing things. When we worship, we are recognizing God is amazing, His character, His grace, and His holiness, His mercy. When you worship, we never, we never lose sight. Are you, are you amazed at God? Does He amaze you? Does He bring, a, does he bring joy to your heart? Does he, does he touch your heart? Because what he does, he continues to do. It'll never end. Because his character is so overwhelmingly, it conforms our heart, it changes us, it changes the roughest, most toughest, most depraved person and draws that person into relationship through the forgiving love of Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing. When we truly worship because we have entered into the very presence of God and we are amazed by him. When we worship, we have yielded to the Lord. That's what we're... That's what we do. Just another challenge. There's a quote here. Worship has been misunderstood as something that, ar that arises from a feeling that comes upon you. We often mistake worship for a feeling. I'll tell you what. I'm thankful for emotions. When I come to worship, I do want to feel emotion. I do want to feel. Uh, it, it is a beautiful thing to feel, uh, to express, and to, and, and to have within you well up feelings that, that are directed to the Lord. But, but we need to be reminded that worship is more than feeling. Because feelings can be deceptive, feelings can be shallow, feelings can be surface, feelings can even be wrong in our life. We can't trust our emotions all the time. Emotions are a, a gift from the Lord. We need to use them and wield them and give them to the Lord. But worship is more than that. Worship touches the will. It is vital that we understand that worship is rooted in a conscience act of the will. You know, when we worship and come before the Lord, we are saying to God, God, touch me. God, change me. God, I want to leave here from, be, from your presence and I want, to be, I want to be closer to you than when I stepped into your presence. I want to be closer to you in my walk with the Lord than when I stepped into your presence just now. I want to love you more. I want to be more faithful in obedience. God, I want to be more like you. Touch my heart. Amaze me. Bring me to the place of surrender and yielding. He touches our will, a conscience after the will, so that we would serve and obey, and I added here, and enjoy the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He calls us to serve and obey, but I tell you what, that only happens best in our life when we truly enjoy the Lord. We're called to enjoy Him. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We're to be committed to worship, coming together. Worship isn't about the songs we sing. They're important. Worship isn't about the style of music. It's important. Worship isn't about the, the lighting, the music, the instruments, the feeling. Worship is about your relationship with Christ. Worship is about you continuing to be amazed by God. Worship is about you and I letting God change us. That's what worship is. Are you committed to that? Now we see here in verse 10 as well, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. That's uh, God's attention getter. You know, when you see the trumpet in Scripture, God's getting the attention. In, 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 uh, in the Old Testament, in Mount Sinai, God's trumpet blast terrified the people. All these things that were taking place. As they met with Him and He gave them the Ten Commandments, it was, they, He was getting the attention. Listen up, this is serious for your life. God's getting our attention. When the rapture comes, the trumpet blast is going to blow. I'm waiting for that right now. Are you? We're going to hear it. Only us who are in Christ, we're going to hear it. It's going to pierce, and we're going to be lifted up. He's getting our attention. That's what he's doing here. And a, and a temple, and, a, and, a, and so it blasted. I heard a voice. He says, I heard a voice, and it was, like a, it was like a trumpet, because it was announcing good news. It was announcing that Jesus Christ was about to act. It was announcing, John, I want your attention. That's what this is all about. And I heard, and, and so he, and that voice said, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. John didn't write what he wanted. The revelation is about what Jesus Christ conveyed to, to John so that he might give it to us. All scripture is given out by God. It's, it's inspired. It's God-breathed. Hebrews reminds us that a long time ago, God spoke through the prophets and now has spoken to his son. And here in John, he's speaking through the prophet John, who's giving, who is prophesying, and he's speaking through his son as well. He's, he's, he is fulfilling and conveying in, in this that happened in the Old Testament as well. It is God's Word. First Peter reminds us that uh, God's Word was never produced by man, ever. There's not, there's not any of God's will that was written in these pages that is man's opinion, man's words. It was from man. This is God's letter, His words to us. Men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We see that clearly and beautifully. You know, as we close, just a, just a challenge here. We've Just the fundamentals of unity. The fundamentals of unity is this. We're family. We need to encourage one another because we're family in Christ. We need each other. We have, we have an understanding, a shared understanding. It's not easy. We have tribulation. We have testing. There is a kingdom that is coming. We are called to persevere, and we have commitments. We are, we are, we are to be committed to Christ and to the Word of God. We're to be committed to these things that we see here in this text. <clears throat> they need to touch our life. And so here's a final, final challenge to us as we close. It's just simply this. Our life, does it reflect authentic relationship? Our commitment is to Christ. Authenticity. To people to simply see Christ in your life. Is it authentic? Is it real? Is it fake? Is it a facade? Is it in words only? Or has it touched your life and your heart? Do people see Christ? Is it real and authentic and genuine? The church is to encourage that. Our commitments, our life is to reflect the reality of this. Our life is to reflect this as well. Our, our love for God's Word. Do you just have a hunger for His Word? You just have a hunger for it. The Word of God is to dwell richly in you. When you come to church, are you eager to write, to learn, to grow? When you open your Word on your own, do you, look, do you, have, a, do you, have, do you have pen and paper? Do you have something... Uh, to write on your computer? Do you, do you intentionally engage the Word of God and learn from it and grow and ask questions from the Word of God and of the Word of God and of Christ? Are you engaging Him and letting it engage into your heart and come into your heart and change you? Are you a student of God's Word? Are you, do you love God's Word? Are you following and are you obeying it? Your life, does it reflect, does my life reflect faithfulness to Christ? Not only am I, not only is He my Savior, but I'm to be committed to Him. I'm to be committed to Him. Testimony of Christ. The word testimony takes us back to that word martus, martyr. He gave His life for us. We're to lay our life down to be used for the Lord. Faithfulness to Christ. 
Does our heart reflect that we are yielded to Him, the Spirit of God? Are you letting the Are you letting the Spirit touch your heart and speak to you? His most powerful tool is this. If you're If you're reading this, He is touching your life. He is changing your life. It's a guarantee. If it's coming into your life, and you are receptive, then the Spirit of God will will bring its life into everything you do. If I never open it, or I reject it, and I don't obey it, the Spirit of God to quench his work in my life am I amazed by the Lord am I amazed if I'm amazed in the, by the Lord all these things are happening I'm growing I'm changing that's a key Revelation is a challenge John writes and he says we're together let's keep moving forward and that be our commitment this morning we're together in this we're brothers we're partners May the Lord draw us together in walking and following after Jesus Christ, I pray. That's our prayer together. Lord, make this true. Bring this into our life and into our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. And we'll pick up. We'll continue next week. I'm looking forward to it.